Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Yoande Zakias is the CEO of Eventful Limited, a pioneer and leading events management and consulting company. Over the years, the business has evolved to include venue management and events curation. She is also a founding trustee and past chairperson of Women in Management, Business and Public Service, WIMBIS, an organization established with the objective of being the catalyst that elevates the profile of women. In addition to her business and social enterprise, she is the author of four books, God's Waiting Room 1, 2, 3, and 4, which were written as a result of her personal testimony and to encourage women experiencing delay in childbearing. Today on the show, she'll be bearing it all. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Mrs. Akias. Nice morning. to see you again. Good morning. It's so good to have you on. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah. So that's such a full intro. <laughs> I don't even know where to start, but I will start with the books that we have with us. Right. It was an absolute pleasure to read them. Oh, God's glad. Waiting Room, one, two, three, and four. four. Exactly. So what inspired you to write the books? Well, I got married in 1989, and I had my son immediately, nine months after. And then it took nine long years before my daughter came along. And during the time of waiting, I sort of said, you know, Lord, if you ever give me another child, I'm going to write a book to help people who have been waiting. Because I found that during that time of waiting, mm. you know, there wasn't really any, you know, resource to go to, anything to encourage you, except, of course, you know, people who had sure. their various faiths. But it was something that people didn't really talk about. And uh, I wrote the book, and the response was just totally overwhelming. It was like everybody was like, I didn't know everybody else felt like that. And, you know, it was essentially a compilation of stories of what people have gone through. Mm -hmm. So people could, you know, there'd been books done abroad, but this was about Nigerians, mm -hmm. you know, Nigerian situation, the Nigerian in-law situation. Yes. And yeah. it just really resonated with people. I thought I was going to do one book, but as you've said, I ended up having to do four because of the demand. Yeah. I think, I mean, one of the things for me that really struck out is culturally, how much burden a woman bears during this time. I mean, I found the book just extremely moving yes. and even at times had to put it down because it was so emotional. Exactly. And, I, I, and one of the things I wanted to ask you, when people started sharing their stories, were you overwhelmed by the, just by some of the, their journeys? Yes, honestly, I was because, I mean, and I think also the first set of women who shared, mm. they shared so openly because mm. I think none of us ever realized the impact that book would have. And as you say, culturally, women do bear the burden. But we were able to see that a lot of, uh, a lot of the stories, it is whenever the husbands were a part of that journey mm. and shared it with them that eventually, you know, they would come to a place mm. of a resolution, whichever way it was. Another thing I found that was, you know, culturally, adoption wasn't talked about yes. at all. Yes. It was seen as something that, you know, you didn't do and it wasn't uh, accepted even faith-wise. Mm -hmm. So we put it out there in book one, and so many people who have adopted because yeah. they read that stories, because they were able to affirm that adoption is scripturally, yeah. you know, allowed. And yeah. also, now, you know, it's, uh, it's now something we're, that... Now um, we're talking about all We're talking issues. about it, and people are, you know, going that way as well. So thank you for mentioning adoption, because one thing I noticed is that the books are full of testimonies. Yes. And each of those testimonies are signed by the woman, her exactly. name and surname. Yes. But the adoption testimonies were not. Why was that? Why were they anonymous? Because we wanted to protect the children. Because some of those who have adopted children had not yet told them that they were adopted. Mm. You know, so we felt that, and that was why I put it in the book, that because we wanted to protect the privacy of this, uh, of this, some of them were people who were really very well known in society and weren't ready to say their stories. But at their own time, they would tell their children they were adopted. Some were happy to share, some tell them at birth. I think in fact, most people say it is better for your children to know from the yeah, beginning absolutely. that they were adopted. Yeah, yeah. But these are still yeah. some of the cultural inhibitions that we will get over at times. And also mm -hmm. wanted to commend you for raising adoption and IVF mm -hmm. as yes. options while in yeah. God's waiting yeah. room. Yes. Because a lot of people misunderstand waiting on God and having faith in God. They think that if you opt for IVF, mm -hmm. if you opt for then adoption, it's a loss of faith or a lack of faith. Exactly. That was so important to stress, that going the medical route is not a lack of faith. God mm -hmm. gave us doctors to help us. And a lot, in fact, you know, after a couple of the books, I got a, a letter from somebody who says, you're not allowing women to stretch their faith when you're telling them they can have IVF. <laughs> and I asked her, have you waited for a child? Of course not. She had her children easily. Mm -hmm. So how does she know? So clearly, those are one of the things that we had to talk about. And in book four, I even had to bring in surrogacy, which is mm -hmm something that a lot of women yes. are considering yeah. and we're also wondering is this scripturally you mm -hmm. know acceptable or mm -hmm. not but i think at the end of the day as long as whatever we do is legal and mm -hmm. moral mm -hmm. you know and our faith allows it and your husband is in agreement mm -hmm. with it i believe everybody has the right to have that blessing of a child whichever way the lord lets, lets them bring it
When women come up to you now and talk, because I'm, I'm sure you're a touch point for people, yes. and I'm sure people come up to you all the time and yes. tell you their story or their journey. Do, do you get people asking you how to cope and navigate the depression that comes with waiting, the lost in fate that comes with waiting? Yes. And what do you recommend to people? Honestly, it's a tough journey, and sometimes I have to really dig deep into my soul because my daughter, who I wrote this book, who you know, she's 20 years yes, old now, yes. you know, so this happened to me over 20 years sure. ago. But you know, you feel the pain every time I go to a gathering where you have to encourage women. You feel the pain, but then every time you hear somebody's amazing testimony, Definitely. you're filled with joy. So my first book actually talks about the things that you really need to do. You know, the time of waiting. Obviously, you have to have faith. You have to pray, and most importantly, you have to get a life. Mm. A lot of people put their lives on hold because they waited they won't take that promotion they won't you know do that uh, uh, course you need to get a life because the thing about it is that god created us to be all round us, mm -hmm. not only to be mothers, sure. you know. So it is an important part of our life, but it is something that we should not let, if it doesn't happen, cloud the rest of the, the blessings that we have. So that, for me, is critical, that people enjoy their lives during the wait. So it's not that when the baby now comes, you're like, oh, God, what did I do with all these years, you know? <laughs> yes, yeah, you know. That's that. yeah. And another point I really appreciated that you mentioned was that a lot of people who have lived blameless lives yes. end up having these delays. So exactly. it's got nothing to do mm -hmm. with your character Car or your past. Your yeah. Yeah, yeah, to because be blamed a lot of people, you know how some other, oh, she must have been terrible, she must have had yeah. 10 abortions. Yes. No, people who have been virgins until they got married can experience delays in childbirth. Mm -hmm. So these are all the myths that, you know, we had to, and all the stereotypes that we had to break. And I believe that with all the testimonies, and it, it's been amazing, people have shared and, uh, it, you know, really personal stories, and it has encouraged really so personal. many people. Really, Even what really they personal. did wrong, yeah, wrong exactly. attitudes they had to repent from, yeah. it was so interesting. People who had gone the other way and going mm. into um, you know herbalist people yes. spoke yes. and it has really really encouraged people I, I mean and, and I I am just so glad that uh We've been I, able to have that impact. I mean, one of the things for me that was so important was also the the, the miscarriage, the stories around miscarriage. Yes. Because a lot of times, one of the things that people don't understand is that I think people. So they, there's this impression that everyone just gets pregnant the minute you know you yeah. get married. Yeah. Of course, there's only. There's, for women, there's only once, uh, well, you can only get pregnant once, once a, a month. month. Yes. So that really means that in a year, you only have 12 chances of getting pregnant. That's it. That's it. And, that, and, you know, education is another key thing. Many people didn't even realize that it's only during the time they're ovulating they yes. can get pregnant. Yeah. Many people are fasting during the time they're ovulating. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it, there's a lot of education that we need to, um, we, you know, we, ju we just need to bring out and we let people understand. So that is... And miscarriage is one of those things that people don't talk about, which yes. actually now, once again, people are talking about more yes. and more because it is part of that journey and part of the things that can derail you. Definitely. There's nothing as devastating because you've got the preg news of the pregnancy, you think you're on the way there, and it's it's as bad when it happens if it's a month into the pregnancy or seven months into it. So it is really, really devastating. But the, the beautiful thing is the book allows you to see that people persevere. I've had people tell their stories of how they've had seven miscarriages yeah. and they still went yeah. on, you know. Yeah. So it's amazing. So I think the thing about it is just to have faith in God and just trust that it will happen. But at the end of the day, also realize that not everybody will go through the same path sure. and just know that this is your path and be joyful and willing to accept it which is I think what's great about the the books is that you present multiple paths to motherhood yes. that's exactly right because that's exactly what God does for us mm. yes different yeah. backgrounds different characters you can actually mm. see the personalities of the women yeah. exactly. come through the stories exactly so and the few brave men because I have yes. had a couple of brave men yeah. who have actually decided to be the ones to share the stories yeah. but it is so encouraging yeah. What gives you the most joy that you have put this out? Wow, what gives me the most joy? Just the fact that people who I may never meet, I may never know, have read these books and have been impacted by them, and many of them have gone along to have their, their, their children. I think for me, I think that's the best thing about it. You did say yes. that people are sowing these books into people's lives and they're going all over the world. Mm -hmm. I tell they you. Are. Uh, I, everywhere. I mean, you'll be amazed at the places of because and you'll be amazed at, I, I, you know, sometimes I just walk in and they say, I, I see somebody beaming and smiling at me. I just know it's going to be the book. And then, oh, my sister read your book and she now has a baby. Oh, my, you know, so it's, it's, it's really, you know, fantastic. There's so many practical tips. But yeah. I want to broaden the conversation a little bit here because this is God's waiting room with regards to childbearing. Yes. But many of us are in God's waiting room for other things. Many other so things. So I really appreciate the fact that you have so many testimonies mm -hmm. and then you have testimony tips, exactly. which teaches you how to decide still 
those testimonies and really get <laughs> and apply it yeah, to yes. yourself. Yes. Can you talk about what, what made you do that? Because that was so important. Yeah. Well, I think maybe it's because I'm just a really practical person and mm. I felt it was important. The book has to add value yes. and people must be able to take something mm. from it. And then also, not many people are great readers. Mm. So I thought, look, if you're not even going to bother to read the testimonies, mm. read the tips. Yeah. So at the end of the day, mm. you'll understand what the things you have to look out for us. And, you know, as somebody once said to me that, you know, I should not put that tag for women believing God for children because the first book in particular applies whether you're believing for a new job, a career, sure. a husband, or whatever it is that is your desire. Yeah. Any, I mean, and there's absolutely no person in the world who's not waiting for something or the other at some time of their life. So I think the basic principles in the book show how to wait and how to wait, you know, uh, with grace. So we have other things we want to talk to you yes. about. So where can people get the book? Uh, the book is principally sold at uh, two points, at uh, my church, the Fountain of Life Church Bookshop, mm -hmm. and then also the Lantana, uh, Lantana Bookshop in Victoria Island. And because they're such a huge bookshop, they have a way to, you know, because I tried to do it at the beginning, but it was a bit too sure. difficult for me. Sure. And I just thought it was better to hand it over to them, and they, a lot of people are able to just buy it from them. But it's listed. I mean, if um, anyone does a Google search on your name, it's listed in so many different places around the world. Oh, fantastic yeah, to hear. Yeah. And that's why we now, I now actually decided to, you know, put it out on social media. So at God's Waiting Room book, um, you know, so I need to talk. I'm, I'm yes. using that uh, medium to talk to people, mm -hmm. to send, uh, you know, messages of hope and to give, uh, you know, testimonies now because I've written four books. I think, um, you know, no, you, the, books, you, you, the books are done. They stand on their own <laughs> they and they will continue own. to be yes. impactful in people's yes, lives. I do, I mean, I do praise the, And I, I mean, I, I want to also commend the people that shared their story. They shared so deeply and vivid. They yes. really I mean, did. it was yes. really vivid. I think that's actually the beauty of the mm -hmm. book because people read it and they're so encouraged because every Everybody finds something that resonates with them. Yes. Everybody finds something that lo this, and then people call and say, "Oh, I'd like to meet so 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 person because her story, our stories are the same." Mm -hmm. So I ask the person, "Are you happy to you know meet this?" So we connect people that way as well. So uh, it's absolutely fabulous. Right. So I want to start out with the events industry in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. People have valued it at all the way up to a couple of billion yeah. billion a year. I want to get a sense from you. Do you do you think that the events industry in Nigeria is in the billion dollar range? Honestly, I don't have any facts, but mm. I would imagine so, because I think the level at which we do the events, the number of events, the number of event planners, and the amounts we spend, clearly, we would go into maybe if not billions, definitely millions of dollars, yes. The data also said the average Nigerian family spends about um, $15,000, um, mm. between $10,000 and $15,000 on a wedding. <laughs> It varies. Yeah. It varies. Yeah. But uh, uh, weddings are extremely expensive yeah. in Nigeria. Yeah. I will say that. Yeah. Yes. And on any given day, there is an event in Nigeria. In, in, I mean, just driving in Lagos. There in Lagos, is an virtually event. every event center you go past, you know, there's something going on, especially when it gets to the festive season. So, so tell me, how do, you, how do you navigate a space that is growing? It's a growing industry. Mm -hmm. People are becoming more and more discerning. You mm -hmm. are a pioneer. Mm -hmm. What a type of innovative, how do you? How do you keep on shaking up the industry? Well, I think is the thing is, you know, I started off essentially as a corporate events planner because of my background as a lawyer, sure. and I used to work in a bank. But along the way, I realized that a lot of my clients wanted me to do the retail events, the birthdays, the weddings, mm. and we went into that. Then I decided, okay, you know, the industry was very new, and there was a lot of, um, you know, a lot of people coming in who really didn't know what they were doing. I started to do training. Mm. So along the way, I just kept evolving. Then the critical thing was obviously venues. I found that I had issues, you know, with a lot of the venues. There were only a couple at that time, you know, 17 years ago, of really high-profile venues. And even those venues would have problems with their bathrooms, would have problems with their cleaning. So I knew the next thing was I needed to be in charge and control of my venues. Of course, that was such a huge, um, you know, financial outlay. Mm -hmm. And I remember somebody telling me, yeah, when you're an event planner, don't go into real estate. Yeah. So what I did was enter into partnerships, and then I was able to manage venues. So you just begin to evolve with the needs of your clients. And then after a while, about four years ago, so that's after being in the business for 14 years, I realized, you know what? I want to actually begin to curate events, to do events that are my events that can be of international standard and that you know can become something new for people to experience. And that was when I started my Sukes. So that really has been my involvement, mm. and I think it has just been in um, in response to whatever the the demands of the uh, 
uh, society where, and also because of my desire to just affect the entertainment landscape of the, the, the nation. We definitely want to hear a lot more about the souks, but yes. then also, like we were saying before the break about your book, when you've seen the impact that you've had, yeah. when you look back on the way Nigerian society is now, having any events is now pretty much unthinkable mm -hmm. without getting an mm -hmm. event planner, Absolutely. and that's thanks to mm -hmm. you. How do you feel when you see <laughs> your work and the impact that you've made it's in true. the way we live? Yeah. I, I think it's amazing, and I think that's why I need to encourage people, you just really need to follow your dream. Mm. Because I remember when I was leaving the bank, I was a deputy general manager in the bank when I left and I said I was going to do this and people said are you crazy but I knew that organizing things and people was what I was really born to do and so it is really really heartwarming when you see how it has evolved and grown and it is at all levels yes. you know so we're not talking only yes. about the the um, niche that we play in which is you know uh, high profile or whatever at every level yes. people have event planners and it's excellent I mean nobody would imagine 17 years ago that you'd have a wedding and it wouldn't be your auntie or your totally. sister's handling that was the way we did that things. was the way we did things in fact people totally. really sort of um, resisted it at the beginning yeah, and yeah. even the corporates the corporates resisted having event planners because they felt look you know the the, the departments was H who's HR taking my job like yes they'll do it <laughs> so it was uh, it was tough to break in but you know i i I'm, I'm so proud of the fact that we were able to do that and one of the greatest things anybody has ever said to me was one of the younger event planners who sent me flowers after some event i think we've both been involved with and said, thank you for leading the way so we could follow. Absolutely. I think for me that's the greatest no, affirmation. You created, created whole this whole You created this industry. You absolutely did. Yes. Thank you. So tell us about the souks. So that, that's your right. next frontier. Yes, that's my, that's my, the bee in my bonnet right now. Mm. I love the souks. You know, what happened was I thought, okay, even if we're going to have this sort of exhibition, the first one had to be around what we do. So whether mm. we do corporate or uh, retail events, we always do food and drink. So sure. I thought, excellent. And then there were so many young Nigerians coming up in the food space. You know, there were chefs, there were... So we just thought, you know, why don't we just bring them all together? And in 2015, we had our first, we called it Fiesta Flavors then, yeah. but it's now called the Food Souk. And we brought together an amazing array of Nigerian talents. And even then, we brought international talent. We brought people from South Africa. But yeah. guess what? When uh, we had the souks came, our Nigerians preferred their Nigerian chefs and they preferred everything. We had the street food area. That mm. was what they loved. Mm. So by the next year, we kept everything Totally local. local. And uh, it's been amazing because people have just seen their businesses grow. People mm -hmm. who would not have mm -hmm. the opportunity to the exposure mm -hmm. have had that exposure. And we're having our fifth food fair this December. Already? It's been five years. And you, you, you know, Time Bella, because you, we've worked yes, together yes, on that. Yes, we worked together on yes, that. And we, um, yes. yes. Congratulations. Yes, so five, five, five years. years. Five, five years of the food. And then what happened then was, you know, we thought, okay, let's look into another. It was actually somebody who mentioned, why don't you do beauty? And I was like, really, beauty? And I thought, oh, okay, why not? Let's try beauty. And uh, we did beauty. The, and we've had three beauty souks, and of course, after the second beauty souk, you've got to do fashion. I was like, no, you know what? <laughs> I'm not the only one in Lagos. But then um, I decided, why not? Yeah. You know, because I, I like to do new things. Yeah. And honestly, the fashion has been incredible. We actually have to have all the other souks are once a year. But when we did the fashion, the first one in July, the pressure to have another one was unbelievable. So we went back to our sponsors. And they said, go for it. So we now have two fashion souks a year. Wow. And uh, we had two last year. Had one in July, and the next one is coming up on December 1. Wow. But the one that I really must share about is at the first fashion fair, my, my, my daughter was on holidays um, from university, Rated Iowa, and she said to me, Mom, I can do this for my peers. You know, all of us, there's so many people into making T-shirts, this streetwear. So I said, she said, we'll call it the street souk. So in December... She ran it together, we supported her, and we had the first street souk. It was a millennial fair. All the vendors were millennials. It was run over. I know we have some them. pictures of that. They're gonna oh, show it was that. amazing. Yeah. I mean, arguably, it's probably one of our best ah! Oh, well. So well, that's, that's where we are with the Souks. Right? So it's, it's, it's really, it's a great initiative. It's, it allows, you know, entrepreneurs to be out there, mm -hmm. gives them a platform they wouldn't have had. And I'm really, really proud of and it. And it's an amazing place to discover new things. So that's it's it. an amazing place to discover new foods, new new fashion, new, fashion, new designers, everything. and also new uh, makeup, exactly, new makeup labels. Exactly. Yeah, and they, yes. do, they do give you a lot of tests. A lot, there, samples, so. samples, a lot of samples, a lot of that. And then we yeah. actually also, with the fashion suits, we do a little, we do a pitch. Uh, we have a pitch where we uh, people send little one-minute videos, oh. uh, you know, young fashion entrepreneurs, and then we have our judges judge them, they get prizes, we give them training. So it's even a lot more than just the buying and yeah. selling. We want to really impact the lives of yeah. these young people. That's a recurring theme for you, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Your career, your 
yeah. our first yeah. life. Yeah. And now let's talk about Wimbiz, which yes. was also created with impact in exactly. mind. Exactly. Wimbiz is just an amazing story. You know, how it started, a young man came to my sister, uh, Dr. Mola Johnson, yes. and said, look, I went to South Africa and I saw a women's uh, organization that had a fair. Can we do it? And she said to me, OK. And that was when I was just starting out my business. I said, you know, you know this could be the first uh, conference you'll organize. Mm. And we now called together some friends of like mind and we started it in my friend's kitchen. In fact, it was Maury de Salo's kitchen that we sat in wow. and we decided who we'd invite. And we thought we were going to do one conference and maybe do a conference a year. And it has just been amazing the way, you know, I think everything that we do is just that right time yeah. for it. And it just, yeah. you know, begins yeah. to run on, on its yeah. own. And that's yeah. the story of Wimbiz. It's a, a great, great organization impacting. You know, and I think one, one of the things is just the, with everything that you've, you've said, it's really your organizational skills that keeps on coming in that is consistent here. So even with the books, just the way you organize the books, the way yeah. the books are, able, people are able to go to the books, grab what they need, yes. and, ha and sort of for that moment sort of get what they need. Same thing with events, and um, same thing with Wimbiz. Yes. I wanted to talk to you about Wimbiz and the work that Wimbiz is doing. Wimbiz has gone... I mean, so much bigger than anyone probably thought of yes, when it first definitely. started. And but one of the biggest things Wimbiz is also pushing now is representation of women, especially politically, exactly. and getting more women involved in politics. That's it. What do you think are the things that are holding women back in Nigeria when it comes to politics? <sighs> Reputation and finances. I'd say off the top of my head, a lot of people, you know, politics in Nigeria is no, I can't go into it. I'm not a politician, but it's a, it's a, it's a very difficult okay. journey. <laughs> it's a very difficult yeah. journey. And I think for women and even particularly married women, the time it takes, uh, what you have to do, it's, uh, it's very, very difficult. So women really need support, the brave women who are ready to do it. And then, of course, finances. Mm. So it's really, really important that we can get, you know, you know, finances together for the people who are, who want to do this. And um, we have a, a actually, a, a, a summit uh, coming up on the 12th of October in Abuja, mm -hmm. WIMPOL, so the Women in Politics, and we have our conference coming up November 7th and 8th. So we have all those uh, avenues for people who are interested, and then of course we have WIMBOARD. Another mm -hmm. thing that's really important to Very us much. is getting women on boards in Nigeria, yes. because that's another thing that we feel that the representation of women mm -hmm. is so low. Mm -hmm. So we have all these areas where we want to ensure that the representation is higher, and where we have our institutions that we have just put out there, so that we can make sure that um, you know women who are interested are able to use our platform to, you know, get to where they want to. Well, thank you so much. It's always such a pleasure to see you, and thank you so much for thank being on the show. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.